Welcome. I am Gabriella Emanuel. I am a senior reporter at WBUR, which is uh, Boston's NPR news station based here. And I'm moderating today's uh, discussion, which is reducing cancer risk through nutrition. This event is presented in partnership with uh, the Zoo Family Center for Global Cancer Prevention as part of World Cancer Day events. I am delighted to be joined by everyone today. We have Ed Giovannucci, who is a professor of nutrition and epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Eliza Leone, a registered dietitian and the wellness manager for Restaurants Associates at Harvard Medical School, as well as a culinary medicine and nutrition course instructor at Harvard Medical School, and Tim Rebeck, Rebeck? Rebeck. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Vincent L. Gregory Professor of Cancer Prevention at Harvard T.H. Chan School. So just to get started, um, we know that an overall healthy dietary pattern has the potential to lower cancer risk by 10 to 20 percent, which seems like a lot to me. Um, do you mind each of you just starting by telling us a little bit about what goes into a healthy diet, and also how we know that, whatever it is. How, how do we have that information? Do you want to go first? Yes, uh, well, a healthy diet can be defined in, in a lot of ways, which makes it you know, difficult to have a simple answer. Uh, I think one simple way to think of it is think of protein, fats, and carbohydrates. And so think of what makes, uh, like, so when you choose your protein sources, Think of uh, healthy sources, which could be plant-based uh, and some uh, meats, particularly lean meats, maybe uh, less on the fatty meats like red meat and processed meats. Uh, for fats, focus on plant sources, uh, nuts, uh, avocados, uh, vegetable oils, olive oil, and less on animal sources. And for carbohydrates, focus on um, uh, whole grains and vegetables and whole fruits and less on processed foods. So I think that's a starting point for a healthy diet. And how do we have that info? Like, how do we know that? Well, um, uh, a lot of the work has been done on diseases, uh, particularly like uh, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And there are many reasons why those diets are beneficial, uh, keeping, uh, like, uh, helping with blood lipids, cholesterol, uh, and uh, glucose. Uh, so, so there's been a lot of work done, particularly on those diseases, but interestingly, <coughs> cancer is probably affected by some of the same mechanisms that affect heart disease and diabetes. So you, you get some of the benefits on cancer, though really like diabetes and cardiovascular is where most of the work has been done. Go ahead. So uh, Ed talked about how, you know, uh, what makes up a healthy diet from sort of the macronutrient perspective. So thinking about the foods specifically, uh, it's generally known that a plant-forward diet, so that's a lot of plants, not only plants. Plant-based means all plants. Plant-forward is very helpful for long-term health. So that means if you've ever seen the, the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate, it's a good like plate diagram where it breaks down the plate. So half of it is fruits and vegetables. A quarter is grains, whole grains and starches, and another quarter is proteins. So the proteins could be plant-based proteins, beans, nuts, seeds, um, you know, tofu, tempeh, those types of things. Proteins can also include animal proteins like uh, the ones that we know to be the most health promoting are um, dairy, eggs, lean meats, and sort of limiting the intake of red meat and ultra-processed meats like deli, mm -hmm. deli meats type thing. And um, I guess I completely agree with what the other two have said. Let me just add what I do. Um, the way I think about my diet, uh, and I try to be healthy, uh, is uh, eat very little, mostly plants. So that's really kind of what they've said. I, we try to keep nutritional uh, sources uh, in our on our plates that are not very well processed so something that came out of the ground or or from a tree or something like that uh, with minimal processing and we also limit our portion size so we don't eat very much of whatever this is 
And um, I think that's consistent with what the others have said. Um, we limit processed foods. And I think it's the evidence for all of that comes from both human studies as well as animal studies that uh, caloric uh, restriction can be very helpful. The populations that have caloric, uh, limited caloric intake tend to be healthier, have less cancer, less um, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, and the animal models that have done that show the same kind of thing. So limited caloric intake, limited processed foods, and uh, uh, plant-based, primarily plant-based diet. So I think we're all saying the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Well, tell me, before we get into some of the specifics, I wanted to hear, see if I could hear just a, a moment about the mechanism, the biology that's underlying this, if we have a sense, you, you referenced it just a bit, but can you say a little bit more about how the food we're taking in is impacting cancer risk, or how do we, what's happening inside? Yeah, I, 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 well, I think there could be many mechanisms. A, a lot of people have heard about antioxid, uh, antioxidants, for example, uh, vitamins. Uh, I actually think the major mechanism, and this is something that Tim alluded to, is uh, related to obesity. Uh, uh, diets uh, contribute to uh, inflammation and uh, uh, insulin levels, having chronically high insulin levels in the body. Uh, and that's related directly to diet, like some processed foods contribute to that, uh, but also uh, obesity. So to the, to the extent that diet contributes to obesity, uh, as, as Tim was talking about caloric intake, uh, having like the chronically high levels of inflammation and, and insulin, uh, uh, probably some lipids, uh, probably a cancer promoting. So they're more like promoting factors. So I think that's the biggest impact of, cancer, of diet on cancer. But there may be other mechanisms that contribute to some specific cancers. And for the ignorant among us, how does inflammation translate to cancer? Uh, well, inflammation uh, is uh, one of the most important uh, factors for cancer. So, so like for example, um, uh, like you know, liver infections, hepatitis is the major cause of, of liver cancer. Uh, stomach, uh, H. pylori uh, uh, infection by bacteria is a major cause of stomach cancer. So, diet-induced inflammation is a little bit more subtle. It's not. It affects like the whole body, not like very specific to one organ. Um, and then also diet um, through inflammation affects uh, insulin levels and, and something called uh, IGF, insulin-like growth factor. So these are growth factors that sort of stimulate, it tells the cells that there's a lot of nutrients around so they keep growing. So it probably causes a lot of cell proliferation. And just by having a lot of cells dividing, you have a bigger chance of getting uh, like a mutation that eventually will, will lead to a cancer. Uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, I think those are the major impacts of, of diet on cancer. And if I can just add, I think, you know, just to be clear that there's acute inflammation, you know, you bump your head and it swells up, right. and then chronic inflammation. And it's the chronic inflammation that, that Ed is referring to, the kind that happens over years and years, and the cells become dysregulated, mutated, and th that's the kind of inflammation that we think diet, nutrition may have an impact on, as well as other things, uh, and that would uh, be very important in, in, in cancer causation. And that type of chronic inflammation, <coughs> are there signs we can see to, to know or tell if we have chronic inflammation? Uh, so there are. It depends on the tissue, of course. There are uh, certain um, molecules that are expressed in tissues uh, that uh, reflect chronic inflammation uh, and uh, we'll go into the details of the science <laughs> of that, but it is possible to look at a tissue and say, uh, yes, there's chronic inflammation acting in these tissues, and in many cases that's reflective of uh, a risk of developing a later cancer. But that inflammation itself is not cancer. It is something that may uh, set up the environment for which cancer can, can be, you know, arise. So uh, when you were talking about the diet, it was very nice to hear kind of the consistency across you. I wanted to start by kind of debunking some of the misinformation that's out there. Um, do you mind, um, perhaps Tim, we can start with you, uh, uh, thinking of a common myth or common misconception and clarifying it? 
I don't know if I could just pick one. There are so many, uh, and sometimes going out into the into social media and reading what people think out there is just mind blowing because you don't know where these things come from. Uh, so I don't really know if I can pick one, but I guess as a uh, as an example, I would say the myths that I find the most uh, uh, dangerous are the ones that uh, supplement uh, nutritional. Uh, you know, nutrition, diet, in, uh, you know, something that you eat with things that are known to be um, valuable medicines, chemotherapy, uh, things that we, that there's good scientific evidence that they will pre prevent your cancer or um, uh, uh, help you when you're diagnosed with cancer. And so I see a lot of mis uh, misinformation on, or, or sometimes disinformation, meaning malicious uh, disinformation, uh, out there uh, that supplants well-established, scientifically determined practice uh, and tries to replace it with something that is just take this pill, just eat this vegetable, just drink this juice, and you don't need your chemotherapy. Those are the ones that I think are the most dangerous. That makes sense. There is a huge market out there um, promoting supplements and vitamins within kind of this wellness industry. Um, tell me, do they have a role to play um, when it comes to cancer prevention? And, and what should we be particularly wary of? Maybe Eliza, you can start. So to go along with what Tim was just saying, anything that claims to be a magic pill is probably not going to work <laughs> or maybe it will work in combination with other things but there is no such thing as a magic pill unfortunately that's what we all as consumers wish we could use but uh, supplements are meant so nutritional supplements are meant to be taken along with a balanced healthy diet so when it comes to the amount of vitamins and minerals that we are able to absorb we our bodies are able to absorb those nutrients more easily through food than we are through supplements. So anytime we're taking any supplements, nutritional supplements, these are meant to help, you know, fill in the gaps of what we may be missing. Um, you know, something that, one exception might be vitamin D in the Northeast area. We just tend to not get enough skin exposure to the sun and not enough quality UV. So uh, that, you know, taking vitamin D supplements is really important, but, um, you know, nutritionally. In general or related to cancer? Um, Ed maybe knows a bit more about <laughs> um, vitamin D and cancer. Yeah, uh, vi vitamin D in, in general, but also for cancer. There, there is evidence, like there was a study uh, called the VITAL study done, done at Harvard, which uh, uh, individuals got 2,000 international units of vitamin D, and there was a significant reduction in cancer mortality after six years. So it wasn't so much a, a reduction on the incidence of cancer. There may have been a small reduction, but particularly dying from cancer, which is obviously important. Uh, so yeah, uh, I mean, it's not 100% established by every study, but, but there's a tendency in the literature that vitamin D is beneficial for cancer. Taken as a supplement. Yes, right, because as, as was said, yeah. like it's hard, you know, you're not going to get much vitamin D uh, going out now in Boston, at least. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Florida, but not in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And do you have other thoughts on um, minerals and, uh, sur sorry, supplements, vitamins to be taken? Yeah, uh, what I, yeah, I think I don't have too much to add. I agree with what was said. Um, I, I think it's okay uh, it may not be necessary, but it's okay to take a, a multivite type of level, like sort of the RDA. Uh, th there's but some potential benefits, um, uh, but not you know well established. But going at the very high doses, like there's some evidence, like very high doses of selenium or zinc can actually enhance cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I would stay away from the large doses, but. But getting, uh, particularly people that don't have an ideal diet, they may actually benefit from getting a little bit more from supplements. And so one other thing I'll add is uh, uh, calcium is, is, I think the evidence is very good that it, it's protective for colon cancer. Uh, so if people don't take a lot of, or eat a lot of dairy products, 
uh, it may not be a bad idea to have some supplementary calcium. And what is the evidence on multivitamins? Uh, multivitamins, uh, uh, there, there are some compounds like folate, folic acid, that may be beneficial. Uh, and then th also there are like, uh, some vitamin D. Um, th there have been um, like some uh, long-term trials, randomized trials, and they don't see any harm. And, and after about 10 years of use, you start s seeing at least a hint of a benefit. So, so there's some evidence with long-term use. That's the thing about cancer that's a little bit tricky sometimes is that it takes sometimes about 10 years to see an effect on, on the cancer risk. So, so it's not definitive yet, but I think there's, uh, it's probably enough evidence to say it doesn't hurt and it may help. Okay, so calcium, vitamin D, and sounds like multivitamin. Seems like there's some evidence there. A little bit, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and let us talk about processed foods and sugar. We have heard lots of things about how this is linked to poor health when we think about obesity, diabetes, heart disease. How do we think about the link between um, processed foods and sugar and cancer? Um, yeah, uh, this, it gets back into uh, earlier points about uh, things like inflammation, uh, insulin, and obesity that sort of go together. And processed foods, uh, you know, that are high in refined carbohydrates and uh, like probably saturated fats, that all contributes to excess energy intake to begin with, uh, and also independently more inflammation, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, chronic inflammation is important for cancer. So, yeah, I think uh, processed foods are definitely a, a, an important a part of the, the equation, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I think this is a really interesting area where misinformation comes in. So people uh, will often think, uh, I shouldn't have sh take sugar, I shouldn't eat processed sugar because it will feed the cancer. Um, people say things like that. And um, that's, not, uh, that's not an appropriate way to think about it, but it does come from somewhere. So we know that there are pathways, biological pathways involved in glucose metabolism, sugar metabol metabolism, like the mTOR pathway, which is really involved in, in cancer and uh, uh, in carcinogenesis. And it is driven by glucose and sugars in cells. That's a, so if you hear that, you might think, oh, well, then I shouldn't eat sugar because it's going to drive a tumor. But that's not mm -hmm. correct. I mean, that, it, we have sugar. You know, we have to have sugars in our diet. Uh, but taking it to not eating refined processed sugar, then I won't feed my cancer, is sort of a good example of where the scientific information is sort of mistranslated. And then people generate fears about certain dietary uh, components or ways of, of, of uh, obtaining nutrition that are not accurate. And it's, uh, it's complicated to explain that because, you know, you have to understand the mTOR pathway and how, how many people can do that, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so let me go to a question um, from, from the um, online audience here. Uh, Tell us about how exercise and nutrition play a role. Uh, well, we're talking about nutrition. So let's talk about the role exercise plays in cancer prevention and how it interacts with nutrition, if it does. Uh, well, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, well, right. It, 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 I, I think there's a lot of um, interaction between exercise and nutrition, <coughs> and, and probably the, the main thing is that the energy balance or caloric uh, balance. So uh, it, it's the uh, exercise is the expenditure part of the, the equation. So, so for example, uh, you know, if people are, it seem like they're eating a lot, but they're training for a marathon and they're very lean, then the diet probably is not as relevant. Uh, if somebody's eating the same amount of food and, and watching TV, uh, and gaining weight, then, then the diet becomes relevant. So, so I think nutrition, uh, exercise can, in a sense you can think of it as can offset some of the uh, potentially bad effects of, of a bad diet. Now I'm not saying 
to have a bad diet and exercise. But, mm -hmm. but y the other way to think of it is like the worst thing you can do is not exercise and have a bad diet. So at least do one. Uh, you know, it's better to do both. <laughs> it's both. better to do both. But, uh, so I, I think it comes down to energy balance. And, and as um, uh, you know, Tim was talking about those pathways like mTOR and uh, uh, things where I inflammation may, may affect, uh, exercise has similar benefits as a good diet in a sense, uh, or lack of exercise uh, causes some of the same problems as a bad diet. So, so I think they're, yeah, we should think of them together, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. So this would be, this is hotly debated within my family. So I would like to hear your guys' thoughts. Uh, and Eliza, we can start with you on intermittent fasting, uh, where you'll go periods without eating and then eat. Uh, what do you think about this, and what do we know about its relationship to cancer prevention? So it's uh, not a surprise to hear that it's debated in your family because it's probably within this room debated a lot. Uh, it's a very trendy diet you know, plan that people like to follow. Uh, I think a big part of why it's so trendy is because people like the idea of you know, as long as it's within this window, I can eat whatever I want, which maybe isn't the case for all intermittent fasting programs, but for many of them, it is. So uh, Tim and I were, or uh, Ed and I were just talking about this beforehand that, you know, within that window, you might be eating foods that have been shown to have a relationship with, you know, uh, increasing cancer risk. So there are maybe, you know, better ways to do a, a intermittent fasting program and not so great ways to do it. Um, however, intermittent fasting has been shown to result in weight loss. So if you're trying, if, if there's weight to be lost and if it reduces the amount of excess fat that your body's holding on to, then that reduces your inflammation and that can help in the long run. However, with any kind of diet plan, especially one that's very um, restrictive and you know, completely changes uh, how you would typically eat, this can't be sustainable. <laughs> so that's definitely worth saying, you know, whenever anyone loses a lot of weight during a diet plan, it's very likely, or I should say, when they lose a lot of weight quickly, uh, it's likely that it will be gained back mm -hmm. and maybe even more. So um, whether it's intermittent fasting or any kind of diet plan uh, with, a goal of weight loss, it's important to make changes that are realistic for you to maintain. When it comes to intermittent fasting related to cancer risk reduction, there's not uh, a whole lot of evidence out there to say that it helps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like I said, there are better ways and not so great ways to follow an intermittent fasting mm -hmm. plan. So. You know, you I, ten, more, 10 more years and then we'll know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, if it takes 10 years to see if a vitamin yeah. works, then, yeah. you know, maybe that would <laughs> benefit us. But, um, yeah, they might have something else to add here. Well, let me ask you another question. Um, either Ed or Tim, do you have thoughts on alcohol consumption and um, cancer risk? Yes. Yeah, well, alcohol is a, a very difficult one because people don't like to hear this message, but alcohol <laughs> is a carcinogen. It's been uh, labeled by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, as a class one carcinogen. It is certainly associated with some cancers, uh, mostly with the uh, patterns of, of alcohol consumption that are high, or certain kinds of alcohol consumption. Uh, we used to think that a little bit of alcohol consumption was okay, and we used to also think that maybe it had benefits for cardiovascular risk and things like that, so people felt a little better about drinking their glass of red wine, but I think, and I'd love to hear the other people's comments on that, but my read of the literature is there is no safe level of alcohol consumption. So, you know, what people will often say is, um, you know, that's inconsistent with my lifestyle, of course. <laughs> But we all take risks, right? We all drive in cars, but, and that's risky. And we may um, wear a seatbelt to minimize that risk. Uh, can we do the same thing with alcohol consumption? That's a question. Um, if you really want to mitigate all risk, then that's a hard thing to do in life. Yeah. But you can, not, you can not drink, or you can make smart choices or limited choices about alcohol consumption. Uh, other thoughts, because, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I largely agree, I, I think, you know, if you're talking uh, like one drink a day, uh, it, 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 that 
area, there, there's some question. I mean, it probably does slightly increase your risk of cancer, particularly in women, uh, because of breast cancer is affected by um, alcohol. Uh, but there could potentially be, uh, uh, you know, some di uh, benefits on diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So, you know, it, it, it's it, you know, it, it, for a lot of people, it's probably better not to drink at all. But, but I think uh, since people do, uh, uh, we should be, you know, but not much more than one a day. Like maybe men, like some, two a day, a glass of uh, uh, red wine, but. But as Tim mentioned, for cancer, it's almost all harm. Uh, so if we're talking about cancer, then probably stay away from alcohol. But at one glass a day uh, uh, level, perhaps there's some, some benefits. Okay. Um, we only have a few more minutes um, for our online audience. Just to wrap up, do you, do you mind each sharing um, how one thing people can do in their own diet or that you would recommend um, people people try or do um, that, that I mean, makes sense within busy lives and where it's hard to cook and uh, daily and you know it takes a lot of time so and money <laughs> yeah. what do you want me to go for <laughs> um, uh, I would go with with reducing uh, processed foods uh, uh, you know, and, and, and keeping an eye on, on your weight, uh, on your, uh, it's hard for people to get the exact amount of calories, but you can measure like your waistline or, or your body weight. Uh, I, I think that's really important. That's ultimately the biggest impact of diet is through uh, uh, body weight uh, and obesity. So I think that's the number one thing. Okay. I would say, uh, we didn't really get to talk about this today, but um, one of the most important things you can do to enhance the nutrition in your life is to become more comfortable in the kitchen. All of these nutrition recommendations come down to what you eat. So learning how to cook, you know, if you have a particular vegetable that you don't like, try cooking it a few different ways. I hate steamed broccoli, I love roasted broccoli. It's <laughs> such a difference, you know? Um, and uh, a second part to something I would recommend is, uh, you know, with all the things we've talked about today, with all of the research out there, it's overwhelming sometimes if you're trying to make big changes in your life to reduce your cancer risk or for any health purposes. Uh, just start somewhere. Just pick one thing that is achievable for you and do that. <laughs> you can't do everything. It's impossible to do everything, so just start somewhere. And when you talk about the kitchen, do you have recommendations for how to make quick and cheap meals? So I'm not sure how much time <laughs> we have left. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, if you're looking for recipes, look for the terms one pot or sheet pan recipes. That just means you're cooking everything in one pot, so it takes a lot less time. You also have fewer dishes to clean in the end, so that's very beneficial. And I mentioned the, the uh, Harvard Healthy Eating Plate earlier, but just try to get as many vegetables on your plate as possible. White vegetables count. Don't be afraid of white vegetables. <laughs> Those also count. And do you have uh, recommendations? Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with them, but I guess I would say it is possible to do this. So I, my wife and I work, you know, 34 hours a day, and we have very <laughs> irregular schedules. And uh, we have, but we have prioritized being able to do the things you just described, simple but um, less processed kinds of foods that we make ourselves. And uh, it is possible to do this. You have to put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. you, it doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it, it, it is possible to make choices that uh, are, are doable in busy lifestyles or for people that don't have money, you know, to, who have not access to, to fresh foods and things like that. I mean, I, I can't speak from that perspective, but I think it is possible. And do you have recommendations on how to cut down on portion size or maybe snacking or wherever people are getting those extra calories? You know, I, 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 we this is just my own um, uh, anecdotal evidence, but we just use very small plates. For example, we use salad plates, not dinner plates, you know, things like that. Uh, small glasses, not big glasses for whatever. We drink water, not anything with sugar in it. You know, um, portion size is uh, so, sort of a psychological thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you feel like you're, eating a full plate of something, then make it a smaller plate. I mean, just 
tricks like that. I don't know, yeah. you probably know better than I do, but that's what we do to trick ourselves. Right. <laughs> I would also say that like 100 calories of vegetables is this big versus 100 calories of oil is one tablespoon. You know, it's maybe not exactly, but it's, it's you can eat a whole lot more uh, fruits and vegetables and like, you know, some, some plants are more uh, nutrient dense than others, but fruits and veggies really, you can, you can eat a lot of them and and fill up on those and feel satisfied with those um, than you can with other foods. <laughs> yeah, got it. Um, thank you for being here today and for this uh, insightful discussion. Our online audience can find more, resource, more resources on cancer, cancer prevention in the YouTube chat. And we hope to see you guys next time. Have a good afternoon.